Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I would say the first thing, this is not good electoral politics for Biden, what he's been doing. The American people are expressing overwhelmingly that they are not happy with Biden's foreign policy in the Middle East. My feeling is that it's pretty incoherent for the reasons we've been discussing. It doesn't show leadership. It doesn't show confidence. It doesn't show a direction. It doesn't show a resolution. Uh, and uh, it, that that's why it doesn't work. It's it's not necessarily the American people saying, do this, do that, whatever, they're divided. But what they see is a lack of presidential leadership. Uh, and that, I think, is absolutely the case. The presidents, especially when uh, the U.S. is providing the armaments for a disaster, presidents need to lead. Uh, they need to make decisions. They need to show the way out of the mess. And that's not happened. Professor Sachs, I want to ask you about um, the conflict spreading to the rest of the Middle East. Obviously, last weekend, three uh, American service members were killed in Jordan. In fact, there's some debate as to whether or not they were actually killed in Jordan because of the nature of the, the this Tower 22 base being on uh, the borderline of countries and there being a lot of public, I think, confusion about why and where American troops are actually stationed all over the world. Um, there seems to be a kind of... Um, uh, admission from the State Department that it is not clear that these so-called uh, Iranian-backed groups that uh, killed those troops were, in fact, Iranian-backed in any meaningful way. Uh, Lloyd Austin ad admitted as much during a press conference recently. And what Iran knew about the attack in Jordan or how operationally it was involved? Um, you know, we believe that this was uh, done by an element of what is known as the uh, axis of resistance. Uh, and uh, these are Iranian proxy groups. Uh, and how much Iran knew or didn't know, we, we don't know. But it really doesn't matter because Iran sponsors these groups, it funds these groups, uh, and uh, in some cases it, uh, it trains these groups on uh, advanced conventional weapons. Uh, and so, you know, I, again, I, I think without that facilitation, these kind of, kinds of things don't happen. Uh, but it doesn't seem to stop Joe Biden from committing to, uh, quote, responding, uh, presumably, of course, with a kind of a violent escalation. Uh, what should the American public, what should our listeners here take away from this willingness to strike before in there's real intelligence about who actually uh, caused these deaths? And what, in your mind, are the greatest risks in terms of escalating into a broader war in the Middle East? My assumption is that the government of Israel wants a wider war. Uh, we hear all the time from uh, the defense minister Gallant that Israel's going to invade Lebanon. Uh, we, of course, know for years and years that Israel wants the United States to attack Iran. So, and we have our own right-wingers uh, like Lindsey Graham, who just uh, can't miss a chance to say how we have to go bomb Iran. Mr. President, hit Iran and hit them now and hit them hard to protect Americans in harm's way. So there are uh, very powerful groups that want the wider war. It would be a complete disaster for everybody. Uh, and uh, the United States is in no position to fight a wider war, no position politically, militarily, in terms of our stockpiles, uh, in, in which have been uh, tremendously drawn down because of uh, Ukraine, another blunder of American foreign policy. Uh, so I believe that the administration doesn't want a wider war, but it's being pushed it is the job of the United States president, by the way, I've observed over decades, really the, the most important job, which most of them fail in, to stop warmongering and the war machine from escalating conflicts, because we've got a very powerful war establishment. Those that sell weapons, those want, that want wars, uh, parts of the Israel lobby and so forth. And so I'm sure the administration is under a lot of uh, external pressure 
and internal advocacy to expand. I can't imagine anything that would be even more devastating for Biden's uh, reelection chances than for this uh, war to expand right now. So my own guess, again, it's not based on any inside information, is that they don't want it. Uh, and, but uh, presidents always called weak. If you don't uh, expand, there are a lot of uh, militias and, para and militaries and paramilitaries all over the place uh, that like the Houthis and others uh, that are saying we're acting in the defense of the Palestinian people or suffering a genocide and so forth. There's a lot of potential for a shooting war expanding all over the region. Iran has made clear they don't want it. I don't think the United States uh, leadership wants it, but it could still happen because it's being pressured all over the place. It's why when you have American soldiers everywhere, and they are vulnerable uh, to being shot at, we need a president that actually leads to a solution of this conflict. And I'll say it uh, again, as I've said a thousand times, these conflicts have an underlying political reality. And the political reality here is that there must be a state of Palestine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I spoke to a guest on rising at the end of last week, uh, who was a pro-Israel guest. And when I, you know, he said what he's going to say. And I asked him, tried to cut through uh, some of what I would characterize as his bara, what he would characterize as his truth, um, by asking fundamentally, how do you think, you know, I know you want to make this all about October 7th, we're going to defeat Hamas. Okay. What is the, the fundamental concern of Palestinians and persist? What do you see as a resolution for that? And there's just, it's incredible the way people just will not respond to that basic point. And you cannot That's help but come to point. the conclusion, right, that they, they you know, how can you not read into the, their conclusion being exactly what was articulated at that uh, settlers conference in Jerusalem last weekend, which is we're going to drive them out. Other countries will take them. Um, they're, they, you know, we're going to set up uh, beachfront properties in Gaza, and that's that's the future that, that we see for ourselves. I am interested in hearing you as we close here, uh, articulate what you think the vision of the future should be. Should uh, how was this, how should this conflict be resolved? Uh, is the expectation that Palestinians who live in these occupied conditions in uh, in Gaza, who have now had um, an, an enormous percentage of housing destroyed, uh, cine uh, cemeteries desecrated, over 16 cemeteries des desecrated, uh, every uh, uh, college, university in Gaza Strip destroyed, is the expectation that they should just move on and stay in Gaza, they, sh that sh they should be permanently relocated from the Gaza Strip, as so many people are articulated with the goal at the Settlers Conference in Jerusalem over the weekend, or should there be some two-state solution or right of return? What do you see as the end to this conflict? I think that if, before we even speak about the end of the conflict, we need to be uh, honest and truthful and not speak about uh, buzzwords and things that are just not factual and, and just making an argument that is emotional one that is meant to make people be angry or upset rather than trying to solve issues. And I think that at the end of the day, if we are looking at Israelis and Palestinians and we're looking at the trauma of women that have been raped and other women around the world told them that actually maybe we shouldn't believe them. Maybe we shouldn't believe all women that have been raped and mutilated and we need to just silence them. I think this is part of the biggest issue that we have, that people can't see Israelis as human and other people can't see Palestinians as human. And as long as we are being used as pawns by international voices that care nothing about our lives and all they care about is to make some cheap political points, this conflict will continue. The way to move forward is for Israelis and Palestinians to see each other as human. And that's what we're doing. And, and I see a lot of hope and promise with young generation of Israelis and Palestinians that are fighting for peace and doing the brave thing and ignoring voices from the West that are telling us that we need to keep on hating each other rather than finding ways to, to live together and oppose Hamas, oppose terrorism, oppose sexual and gender violence against Israeli women uh, and try and heal from that. But it will take a long time, definitely. With all due respect, I'm sorry, can you just answer, be responsive to the question about uh, Palestinian concerns about their substantive rights? I don't think that that is a Western argument. This is a very organic argument in a fight that Palestinians have been engaged with for 75 years. What should be done to address their substantive concerns about being treated equally in Palestine, arguments for either their own state or for full treatment under the law 
in Israel and the right to return. Do you have any thoughts about how to resolve those fundamental claims that are driving this conflict? I think that if you ask Israeli members of parliament, Arab Israeli members of parliament, pal Palestinians, they would tell you that they, actually yesterday there was an argument in the Israeli parliament where an Israeli Palestinian Arab, an Arab Palestinian member of the parliament, argued that Palestine would be created and he believes that it, it will be uh, a country that lives side by side with, uh, with Israelis. If you ask Israeli Arab Supreme Court judge, a Palestinian Israeli Supreme Court judge, he would tell you that he also thinks that, is, that Israel would live side by side with Palestinians. I think there are many genuine voices that want to reach peace, but we have to really look at what happened on October 7th. We have to look at the trauma that Hamas inflicted on Israeli girls that they raped. We have to look at the mutilation. We have to look at the violence that was never seen in Israel and really recognize that we haven't had a chance to grieve. And instead of grieving, we had voices from the West telling us that this didn't happen. Maybe we shouldn't believe all women uh, uh, that are victims of rape. And I think that's really the, the core of the issue here. We weren't able to heal because of voices that want us to keep fighting. Um, I believe in peace. I'm going to continue fighting for it. Just for the record, an Israeli member of parliament um, was, uh, they're voting, parliament, the Israeli parliament is voting to expel a lawmaker specifically because he articulated support for the genocide case. That is the condition that people who are supporting or even articulating any interest in humanitarian concerns of Palestinian are experiencing in the Knesset right now. We appreciate you joining us and offering your perspective. Please feel, feel free to have the last word if you'd like. Yeah, sure. It was a Jewish Knesset member. There was a Palestinian Arab yes. member of the Knesset that actually argued for a Palestinian state. And the Jewish one was actually removed from the Knesset. So that's the sort of democracy that we have in Israel. For, for advocating for humanitarian rights of Palestinians. It, it's unfortunately... I, I think that's what he said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate that so many um, Jewish advocates for humanitarian uh, interests of Palestine have been accused of anti-Semitism and suffered very similar treatment as Arab Americans in this context. But we appreciate you joining us today. In fact, I don't know if you've seen this, there's a really incredible, and I mean that in a not credible, yeah. not in an awesome way, um, commercial that was airing on Hulu that I happened to come across last weekend. I was, I was trying to uh, binge watch Fargo. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it's like AI generated images. Maybe we'll put a clip in here, but you have to really see it to believe it. It's AI generated images of um, what Gaza could be if Hamas didn't exist. And it's like uh, a resort in Greece or something. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're just like looking at these images of Gaza and all these happy people in hotels with six fingers, you know, AI generated. And then at, at the dark music comes on and it's like, this is what Gaza could have been without Hamas. And it's so, in such poor taste. Yeah. And so outrageous. Come visit beautiful Gaza with its stunning beaches and charming boardwalks. You can stay in one of our five-star hotels and get a taste of the best in Middle Eastern food. Embrace the vibrant nightlife of the city and experience a culture rich in tradition that... This is what Gaza could have been like without Hamas. But it, but it really is, I think, a lens into the psyche of these the right-wing extremists in Israel and the kind of narratives that they are consuming um, and what the end game ultimately is because the, the black mirror flip side of all of that imagery is this is what we're going to do with Gaza when we have actually pushed out all of the Palestinians and settled it. It's so interesting, you know, uh, of course, our students were attacked for uh, uh, for the uh, chant of uh, from the river to the sea. Uh, that was said to be a Palestinian uh, or Hamas slogan, but the, the it's the Israeli government that literally has this as its policy, uh, and uh, not in a shy way. We hear it all the time from them. So this is really what we are grappling with, uh, with a uh, supposed ally uh, that uh, has a, a vision that is uh, devastatingly illegal, unjust, and now uh, genocidal according, or quite possibly genocidal according to the International Court of Justice. And that is where we have to take some decisions as the United States of America and where the president of the United States has a responsibility to take some decisions. We're not gonna change the view of Netanyahu, Smotrich, Ben Gavir, uh, Gallant, and uh, others in this government, but we, can clarify our own position 
and stop supporting something that is completely unsupportable. Get to your point, um, at that uh, settlers conference, who was it? It was uh, uh, Shlomo um, Shlomo Kari, who's uh, a communications minister. He said on stage, quote, there will never be a Palestinian state between the river and the sea. This is not subtle. This is not subtle. This is the point. But you have to know what to listen for. And the reason that the American people don't know about it is, first, this is a change from 25 years ago. It's really a change. Israel mm. has become in the hands of extreme right-wing religious nationalists. This is a, a first point. Second, there's a whole campaign of APAC and others to hide all of this reality from the American people. And so this is why it's not understood. But, you know, videos are pretty powerful these days. People are hearing things that they would not otherwise have heard. This is the reality. And it's uh, it's only now uh, coming to uh, uh, some understanding. I find it shocking, you know, having uh, known Israel firsthand and uh, through many, many visits and so forth over a period of 50 years, what a change has happened to the country. And I should emphasize again, it's a change to the political power in the country. I don't know. I still believe that uh, some significant core of, uh, of the public there uh, would, and of course should absolutely uh, accept international law and two-state solution and peace and so forth. But I know that there's a part that is so rabid and wild, and it happens to have political power right now and military power right now, and that's why it's committing these war crimes. It's tough. I mean, polls uh, of what Israelis are thinking tends to suggest that they overwhelmingly support the siege on Gaza. You have this, these remarkable videos of Israelis protesting the few, the meager number of aid trucks that are waiting to get in uh, to Gaza. Uh, at the same time, you do see increasingly these very small but growing number of domestic protests and how horribly they are being treated, uh, the few Israelis that are able to speak up at the time. I strongly recommend people go and listen to a recent episode of Katie and Aaron's uh, show where they interview, uh, Katie Helper and Aaron Mate on Useful Idiots, where they interview the family member of, of two people who were, his parents were killed on October 7th, and he's taking this opportunity to still try to fight for peace, which is, is pretty remarkable to hear. But he articulates in that interview how maligned he is and what a target he becomes for saying as much, even though he is someone who was so directly victimized on uh, October 7th. I do want to come back, uh, if we could, to this question of the broad, broadening war in the Middle East. It's interesting to see the Biden and Trump campaigns uh, accusing each other, uh, blaming each other for the devolving situation in, in the region. <clears throat> this is from Politico. Um, it says, advisors to Donald Trump and Joe Biden are training jabs to speak over which president is more to blame for Iran's uh, latest deadly actions as both men. Of course, that's presuming that it was, in fact, Iran behind this, but never mind. As both men head toward a rematch in November, the accusations, blah, blah, blah. Um, the military and policy decisions leading up to last weekend's violence are many. Trump's ordered assassination of Iran Major General Kasim Soleimani, Biden lifting sanctions on Tehran. Those are the, that's, that's the slings and arrows. You know, it's your, it's your, you know, you assassinated Soleimani. Uh, you lifted sanctions, Biden, on Tehran. Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal. Um, what do you make of these jabs of who's more responsible to the breakdown of this relationship? Are both parties at fault? Should we take anything at all from this or is it just political brinkmanship? Well, <laughs> I think uh, both have a, a lot to account for. And uh, uh, Trump, uh, it's important to remember, uh, after uh, broke immediately the JCPOA agreement with Iran uh, that uh, absolutely uh, contributes to uh, the regional instability. But the fact of the matter is, uh, of course, part of this just normal campaign stuff, but a president of the United States is responsible for U.S. foreign policy right now, and Biden needs to get his act together, uh, which he doesn't do. 
Uh, and so fundamentally, whoever's trading barbs, it's Biden's responsibility to uh, straighten out what is happening right now. And it's not good enough to mumble, uh, which is what he's been doing. We're going to have to continue uh, at some point soon, I hope. Uh, OK, uh, but I'm, I'm going to have to run right now. And it's a wonderful to be with you. I really appreciate it.